So uh, some of you uh, tuned in after the song played. Uh, the song that my group, Satigata, we have a song um, on our new album that will be released hopefully um, in June at some point. After a long awaited uh, period of recording and file sharing and nuancing and mixing and mastering. Um, and the song uh, called Raindrops to Waterfalls has a an early chant uh, in the Pali in it. And the chant is as such. It goes, Anicca Vata Sankara, Upada Vaya Damino, Upajitua Nirudchanti, Tesam Vupasa Mosuko. Anicca Vata Sankara, Upada Vaya Damino, Upajitua Nirudchanti, Tesam Vupasa Mosuko. So what does this mean? And the meaning of this chant is, <clears throat> as said by the Buddha, all conditioned things are impermanent. It is the nature of them to arise and pass away. To be in harmony with this truth, such wisdom brings great happiness. Yes, and easier said than done. <laughs> Impermanence. And I'm curious, when I just pop out this word, impermanence, what comes to your mind? Go ahead and unmute and just jump in popcorn style. I'm going to say it again. Impermanence. What feeling, thought, quality, dilemma? <laughs> What comes to mind immediately? Don't think too hard about it, but just from your heart. Change. Flow. Ch okay, change. Someone said change. I think, Leah, that was you, right? No, groundless. Oh, groundless. Okay, good. Yeah, groundless. Somebody said change. That was Susan. Oh, Susan, thank you. Yes. Um, Kate, Kate writes um, pain in the chat. You can also post things in the chat. Pain, yeah. Biscuits, biscuits and chocolate. Biscuits and chocolate. <laughs> when I experience impermanence, I often relish in the impermanent nature of that experience. Mm, I think you're way ahead of us, Michael. <laughs> and the good news is that hopefully there's a store around the corner and you can always get more. <laughs> but see, that comes with its own dilemma. That's at the heart of the teaching of what we call craving. Yeah? Yes. We run out. That's the problem. We go to the store for more samsara. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not cheap these days. <laughs> yeah. And what if the store closes or there's a fire? And the store burns down. Then what do we do? Uh-oh. There's the big uh-oh moment, right? And sometimes that does happen. But we have others here in the chat as well. We have some interesting uh, entries here. Uh, Jwen says opportunity. Yes, good. Um, Lauren says Buddha. I like that answer too. Yeah, impermanence, Buddha. Uh, if we had time or if we were on retreat, we would kind of see what you all mean by this and really unpack them. That would be interesting. Heinz says clouds. Yes, absolutely. Boy, they're great teachers and uh, also great to use as a as metaphor for mind, right? Things gathering, dispersing. Karen, flow. Yeah, good. Great. And Don, also opportunity. Karen also says cycle. I'm assuming that's not a two wheel thing with pedals. That's a, okay. I know what you mean. I'm, I'm being a wise guy here. Cycles. Um, Marie says surrender. Uh-huh. Lauren freedom. Yeah. Possibility. Don, thank you. Nadia life in this planet. Hmm. Exactly. And, uh, and then source of art or poem by Xuan. Relief. Interesting lore. Boy, I'd like to know what you mean by that, by relief. 
um, why impermanence is a relief, but that's what comes up for you. And that's really cool. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's a matter of this idea of these two shall pass mm. and, you know, relief in like things can be different, better. Like, yeah. <laughs> We're not resigned to our lot in life or, or to a situation. Yeah. And, and maybe that's also where opportunity uh, comes into the picture, possibility, freedom. Yeah. Great. Great. Good. Great responses. Uh, there are more positive responses here than uh, often I get when I introduce this to other groups. So you're all practicing well. <laughs> a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the things that interestingly no one said, but that usually does come up is death um often loss is another one that is very common grief um and naturally because of change because of the ubiquity of change and <clears throat> there is this sort of dilemma around impermanence uh that on one hand if we believe and we understand impermanence we're seeing things as they are, and yet what arises, what can arise from that is discontentedness or suffering, right? But the other side of that coin is the belief in permanence, especially when things feel negative, bad, or challenging. If we believe in the permanence of something, then we're also in, in, in we're sort of entrenched uh, and grasping and in aversion because we don't believe this is going to change. Uh, and even if we know it will change, it doesn't always feel like it's going to change or it will change quickly enough. So you see, there's two sides to this coin, the permanence and impermanence coin. If things are bad, it feels like they've always been bad or they will stay bad. If they're good, we worry about losing what we have in the moment. This. Um, this teaching actually is very early in the Buddha's career. Um, and there, the, the very first teaching that the Buddha gave, uh, his first teaching on the Four Noble Truths, um, dealt with this very subject, this notion of impermanence, that all things, all conditioned things are impermanent. And then there's the, uh, his second, um, what they call sermon, Anatta Lakana Sutta, where he talks about non-self, um, impermanence and such, and um, the nature of non-self, which we'll get to. That's the third uh, of these four seals. And then much later, we see uh, thinkers like Vasu Bandhu, Asanga, people who were um, instrumental in furthering the tradition we call Yogacara that was really focused on meditation practices uh, that made its way east and um, this uh, notion of anitya a-n-i-t-y-a anitya is the sanskrit for impermanence or anicca which is the pali version of that same word uh, really becomes kind of the situation that give rise to the three poisons the three poisons of greed hatred and delusion are largely a part of uh, the second of the four seals, which is suffering or dukkha. So we have impermanence as the very first, uh, the, the truth of impermanence or the fact of it in our experience is that we tend to suffer, that discontent and dissatisfactoriness suddenly is a part of our lives because things are constantly changing. All conditioned phenomena are, con are constantly changing. And then the third is the truth of non-self, or what later uh, came to be known as emptiness of shunyata. That really, you know, the truth of the matter is that all things are truly uh, empty, quote unquote, or absent of any kind of inherentness, any kind of inherent existing uh, identity or essence. Uh, that, so that'll be the third week as we move into that. And then in the Mahayana tradition, the fourth seal. This is where the goods are. And the fourth seal is Nirvana. Nirvana. And 
this was included largely as an encouragement to and a reminder that the wisdom of these first three seals and how we practice them really can lead us to freedom, to experiencing the unconditioned state. So if we go back to impermanence, the very first one, impermanence is really just a matter of things arising and, and dispersing or the dissolution of things that come together. But it doesn't imply a complete disappearance of things when they dissolve. And so, like some of you, I think very rightly put in the chat or mentioned here, impermanence really is a matter of opportunity. It is also not just a matter of dissolution, but it's a matter of these elements, dissolution, but then things reifying, coming back together. And so it really is more about change, the ubiquity of things constantly changing. And it's actually good news because it means that whether we're practicing meditation or some other form of dharma or spirituality, <clears throat> that progress is possible. It's because of impermanence that we actually can start to see things in our lives feel different. We can start relating differently. We're not wired to our habitual reactive habit bodies, right? And so whether we're talking about neuroscience and neuroplasticity or quantum mechanics that also posit that there is no such thing as disappearance, nothing vanishes into a vacuum. In fact, there is no such thing. Things recombine, they, they change, they go from gross level into very refined, subtle levels. And then the causes and conditions come back together for something new. So this is constantly happening and a good reason why our motivation and our intention can bring intentionality and consciousness into that process. In other words, what we concentrate on, what we focus on really matters to impermanence. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's, and again, that's good news. There is a power in that intentionality, in that consciousness that we bring into things. There's a power in that cultivation to work with the truth of impermanence for auspicious things. Now, part of, uh, part of this uh, way of thinking, or rather this philosophy, is, first of all, that all four of these are ubiquitously true. In other words, impermanence applies to absolutely everything that is conditioned, that exists, every phenomena, including ourselves, right? Um, so that was the first thing. And yet our understanding, the wisdom we gain by sort of really penetrating through these four seals with insight, mean that there is great wisdom at the heart of this. As I said at the beginning, all the Buddhist teachings are here in these four seals. Yeah, they, they're all contained within these four categories. The other thing is that uh, what is called the Pratitya Samutpada, or the doctrine of codependent arising. If, you know, if you haven't heard of this before, uh, it's really fundamental to what we're talking about, because what it is, is that it, it explains how do things actually come into being. And there are later, in, in the later traditions, um, they identify these 12 links, or nidana. Nidana is the word for link of how things arise. And interestingly, it all begins with ignorance <laughs> as the first link. In other words, not knowing the nature of things gives rise to certain feelings, volition, certain forms of consciousness, uh, mental states, matter, sense bases, contact, and so on and so forth. Um, and so in our experience of things, we develop this sense of reality. And I call it a sense of reality because it starts to color how we see all things. And in other words, we lose, we lose kind of that pristine awareness of things as they are. And so meditation practice is there to help basically rewind that process. 
to reverse engineer <laughs> our own minds back to its fundamental nature. It's one way to think of it. Um, so in, within these four categories, these four seals, if you will, and, and again, we're not talking about large mammals on the beach in Santa Barbara. Um, four seals, yeah. I love that joke. Some of you have heard it too many times. <laughs> Elsie's laughing. I think I said it in class a couple weeks ago. <laughs> um, so uh, impermanence. We are all helpless to this truth. We are all part of it. And remembering that impermanence is not just that side of the coin that is decay, dying, but it is also that there is constantly new life coming together. New things are constantly uh, being created. Um, and it's interesting how having done chaplaincy uh, and done for five years full time uh, oncology chaplaincy and done end of life work and being with people at their end of their lives, how powerful the impulse is to stay alive, to keep living. One thing that we're taught, certainly also in Buddhist teachings, is the moment we're born, we begin dying. Now, this isn't just to freak us out, right? But it is there to give us a perspective. In fact, in the mindfulness teachings, in the Satipatthana Sutra, which is the 10th discourse by the Buddha, um, he invites us to contemplate the various parts of the body what are called what's called the corpse in decay now for a lot of us that feels non-intuitive i think especially if you're young <clears throat> it can be more of an abstract idea because the hope is that you'll have a long life ahead of you but some of us have probably lived most of that and are kind of looking ahead a bit um and it starts to become more of a lived reality not that we're all dying but the prospect of dissolution of this body. And yet, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism in particular, there are so many practices to help prepare for this. So that in that process of death and dying, we're not just dissolving into nothingness, but we are actually able to cultivate the qualities, uh, the, the more wholesome and auspicious opportunities, as some, as some of you said, for the transition states that are called the bardos. Um, and yes, this does happen in a cosmology, in a particular belief of death and rebirth, death and intermediate state and rebirth. But either way, you don't have to necessarily believe in reincarnation. The key here is in many ways, when we're dealing with our mind and our thoughts and the things that suffer that causes suffering if we're sitting on the meditation cushion and just relentless thoughts coming and going paying attention not just to their arisings just like heinz is, is, is you know gave us this uh great word clouds exactly they're they're gathering they're coming together but it's it's interesting that the dissolution of these things reveals more of their nature than their arising <laughs> does that make sense the dissolution of a thought is actually bringing you wisdom saying yep yeah, here and gone and the gone that's the truth now here comes another one right behind it galloping along just waiting for your attention um and so you know this process happens constantly right just like the clouds they come they go they come they go but if you're in an airplane let's say you're you're seeing the clouds there and they look so real sometimes i don't know if you've had this experience you're in a plane and it almost looks like you're going to hit a mountain i hope that never happens to you but you realize oh that's just a cloud formation and you go right through it and it's totally insubstantial Another thing, another way to, to talk about this is paper tigers, <laughs> that the mind gives us so many paper tigers as opposed to real tigers. Here we're talking about 
real threats, real something that really we need to pay attention to in our lives, as opposed to an imagined threat or a projection, meaning that a paper tiger cannot harm us. Um, so it's really about seeing kind of the truth about uh, impermanence and leading to wisdom. And not that impermanence is a good reason to suffer, but rather to realize that letting go is not loss, but it's freedom. That letting go is not loss, but it is freedom. If we can sort of move with those waves of gathering, dispersing, and feel ourselves, even if there is grief, even if there is a sense of, you know, really sad this is ending because it's been so wonderful, that there is still freedom possible in the midst of that. And, you know, I, I think it's Rilke, the, the great poet, uh, Maria Rayner Rilke, who said that grief is really the highest form of praise, that it really is that we have valued something or someone or a situation that has opened up the heart and allowed us to love deeply. And yet because of impermanence, we also have to let go. So I think one of the blessings anyway of aging is that you get used to that at some point. It doesn't mean that you're happy to lose anything, but you're familiar with the contours um, of that. At least I hope that's true for you. So the truth of impermanence can also be that which is, encourages us to live in a greater state of simplicity less stuff to cling to, to, to grasp, yeah, to hold on to with for dear life. But rather, to see things as coming and going. And that there's something much deeper, much more significant to this life. If we're on the path, this is why the path is so helpful. We have something reliable. And that's the, that's the other key here. Something may not be permanent. A person in our life may not be permanent. I mean, they're subject to old age, sickness, death, injury, things like that. Or just subject to change. You know, you didn't do anything wrong in the relationship, but this person feels like they need to be free from it and go in other directions. <clears throat> so... It's not so much a question, perhaps, of permanence, looking for permanence, but perhaps it's more looking for reliability. Because that is okay to do. That we can do. Reliable things, whether it's a really close friend, a reliable car that you're driving, it doesn't mean that it's permanent. But it's something that you can hold on to. It's something you can root yourself in. The path itself is probably one of the most reliable things that has been borne out by all the great teachers and practitioners and wise ones that have come before. We have good reason to rely on uh, the path of spiritual practice. It doesn't mean, though, that our teachers are permanent, right? It doesn't mean that the society to which we apply the teachings is permanent doesn't mean that this world is permanent. Um, so reliability matters. Yeah. And perhaps that can be something to anchor ourselves in. Just like we anchor ourselves in the breath, although each breath is different from the one that came before and the one that will come next. Impermanence, only this breath, and yet this breath supports, is reliable for now. And it's the for now that matters. Impermanence says, hey, come back to the present moment and deepen it as much as you can and see what's being missed in this moment. Because the next moment will be different. There's this notion of the two arrows as well. And in Buddhism, the two errors of suffering, which we'll look at next week a bit more, but that 
really, you know, the, this deep anguish or suffering that comes with grief and loss uh, is often seen to be not just the pain that comes with being embodied in this fragile human body that is so subject to injury, illness, and death, which is the first arrow, right? It's the first, um, it's that pain is inevitable, right? It be, being born in this body. And the second arrow is the suffering. The suffering that comes with the first arrow, the anguish. The Buddha taught that you can't do anything about that first arrow. It just is. You know, it's, it's, it's the lot that we all share because of impermanence. But we can do something about the second arrow. We can actually turn the loss of this beautiful child, that this person, this hiker that you met, into something really profound and deep and an expression of preciousness and love despite the pain. This is why I feel like grief, specifically, the grief of loss, is not a second arrow problem to solve. It's part of the first arrow. It's natural. It is natural to grieve a loss. It's part of loving. It doesn't feel good. And we have to learn how to change our relationship to that which we're losing, perhaps. But that's the second arrow. But the actual rawness of the feeling, there was a lot of truth in it. And you have, you know, great monks and nuns and monastics and teachers who, upon losing their precious root teacher, also grieve that loss. In fact, the Buddha, one of the great teachings uh, as he was dying to his closest disciples was the, were these teachings of impermanence and trying to get them to really see that, you know, you can not to grieve the loss of this Siddhartha Gautama body, yeah, but really to continue to embody the teachings. This is more important than me as the Buddha or than our teachers, and that's how we can honor them. So this fourfold, these fourfold uh, stage stages that we're looking at, these four seals, really and truly are about fundamentally about wisdom coming into wisdom. And it begins, this journey begins, I think, with recognizing the ubiquity of change and not just yeah, as, a, as an idea, but really seeing it and then relating to that quality of change, relating to impermanence in some of the ways that we're sharing right now, as opposed to with just sheer panic, anxiety, loss. There is a richness to this, to this first seal. And we're all in it. We're all in it together. <laughs>